This is the feast of the presentation of Jesus to the temple in Jerusalem. It's actually falling on a Sunday. So it becomes our scripture for this particular Sunday. And, and when you think about it, it is something that Mary and Joseph knew they had to do. It was just part of what they knew to do. And, and when you think about their life and how it had been upended over the last 14 months or so, angels showing up, Mary getting pregnant, on the way to Jerusalem, to Bethlehem, counting. <sighs> Remember, in Luke's gospel, you got to be careful which bunch of characters you count, but it was a crazy time. I have a feeling they just thought, wouldn't it be nice if we could just go to church and just, it would be quiet. Wouldn't it be nice if nothing really happened? And so what they get there, I'm not going to tell you really why the deeper reasons why they were there, but they get there to do what they needed to do, and there's Simeon. Simeon has been waiting and waiting and waiting in the power of the Holy Spirit for this moment, and then speaks about what is going on and makes it so clear how powerful it is that this light has come into the world for the Gentiles and beyond. And we are gifted by his prayer that we pray over and over again in the life of church. And then there's a prophet, Anna. Anna is there of great age. She also in that power. She has been waiting and she proclaims as well. I'm just, I'm just thinking about Mary and Joseph going, hey, can't we just get out of here? We've got other stuff to do. But they could not escape what had been given to them. And it is again made clear what's been given to them. This great gift of responsibility, this great gift of joy, and clearly the pain that will come, but the gift that it will be for all of us. So as I was reading this and hearing this, the, the last line, which was in the scripture from the gospel, that sort of summed up this little snippet, this pericope, the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom and the favor of God was upon him. It was like looking into the future and seeing what was going to happen with the desire of writing it down. Not unlike what could be conceived of as an epitaph. How you would sum up where you were going as you were on your way to get there. Now, if any of you have encountered the wisdom collected by Stephen Covey in The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, Stephen Covey basically didn't write anything new. He was able to find a lot of good stuff and put it in one useful place. And in his seven habits, the first one is be proactive. When you think about it, Simeon is proactive. He is there in the temple waiting. Anna as well, waiting for that which is to come so that he can make his proclamation, that he can see what is happening. And, and you think about that in the life of St. Timothy's. I want you to hear the dual tensions that come from this. Are you not also being proactive in getting ready to find the next rector of this parish? You're not waiting, you're doing the work. We've already had Post-it Note Sunday. Search committee's out there doing its job. Now, there's a, another piece of wisdom that flows out of, of coming. And it's seek first to understand and then be understood. Seek first to understand and then be understood. He is trying to say as clearly as he can, Simeon is, let's say, to Mary and Joseph, why they're here. He wants them to hear him and not be afraid. And then he exclaims for what's going on and to be understood clearly about what might happen but to remind them that they are not alone. Just by their mere presence there, they were bathed in God's love. Because the power of the Holy Spirit is hard, hard not to see when it is truly evident, as it was both in the persona of Simeon and in the persona of Hannah. So seek first to understand and then be understood. You did Post-it Note Sunday, right? Did you read the article in the epistle lately? All right. So you may have seen the idea of required, expected, delighted. And, and the idea is this. 
All your post-it notes are part of the seek first to understand and then be understood. And what are you starting with? How do you interpret this? How do you prioritize stuff? Well, the search committee is going to take your thoughts and what's required in a priest. Well, you want them to show up on time, that'd be nice. You know how to do a few other things. Or when you're required, you, you, you go to a hotel, right? You want a nice bed. Now, what's expected is a little bit more, all right? Somebody might be conversant with scripture, etc. You can think about the various things you lay before the search committee. In that hotel scenario, you would certainly like to have an iron in case your clothes are wrinkled. But then when you get to that which delights you, that's harder. That's harder to communicate. You know, chocolate on the pillow, as long as it's a nice pillow, is nice. But you gave so many evidences of great things to the search committee, I wanted to remind you that you are doing kind of the same work that Mary and Joseph have had overwhelmed on them. There's a lot to go through in trying to find the next priest. So if you seek first to understand and then be understood, be proactive, then perhaps the outcome will be powerful and wonderful and God will certainly be there. Now, Covey has another piece of wisdom in the seven. This is the last one I'm going to work with. I like this one because I think it fits us very well. And it fits in with what's going on with Anna and Simeon, Mary and Joseph, Jesus and us. Begin with the end in mind. Begin with the end in mind in mind. And so part of what you did on Post-it Note Sunday was start to lay before each one of you how it ought to come out. What would it be like in three or four years that would say, this was an exciting and good thing, doing the begin with the end in mind. What's it going to be like to have Jesus in the world, Mary and Joseph? Begin with the end in mind. One of the exercises that Covey likes to do is, as I used that word epitaph earlier, is to say to a person, how would you like to be remembered? How would you like to be remembered? I think there's a really good epitaph in the Psalm. Psalm uh, 84 verse uh, 11 says, no good thing will the Lord withhold from those who walk with integrity. Wouldn't it be nice if that was on a tombstone and that was basically how others understood you and you understood yourself, that walk with integrity. You were a person of your word and that you knew your strength came from God. That's kind of what that is. So let, let me give you an example of how we could enter into the joy of this exercise. I gotta do a history lesson. Can you hang with me for a short history lesson? The Great Awakening. Late 1700s, early 1800s, basically the late 1700s. There are preachers out there like George Whitfield who are gathering people from outside the churches into the fields, preaching God for hours just with great joy. Do you think the preachers in the churches were all that happy about that? Not particularly. See, they were coming out of a tradition where primarily they would write things down to get it exactly right, which was important, but it could be incredibly dry could be you'd have to sit in church for two to three hours to have somebody not look up from a text. But that was um, looked at as a value uh, because what Whitfield was doing was preaching in an enthusiastic manner. Enthusiasm was not a good thing. So there was this one preacher whose epitaph after 40 years of preaching from like the 1700s into the early 1800s was he preached for 40 years without enthusiasm. Now it's funny, see, we can laugh at that because we understand the value of enthusiasm as we have received the word. And so when you're beginning to think about how you would like others to understand yourself, see the seek first to understand and be understood, they go hand in hand because it can, the language can flip, the imagery can flip or whatever. I'll tell you what, I think if I am at all good at what I do, and I hope I can aspire to this, that my epitaph would come from um, the parable of the talents. The parable of the talents where there's the two who return four or the one has five returns 10. 
I have to make sure in my brain I'm not confused that I'm better because I had five to return 10 or what. It has nothing to do with the number that you return because it's the same reward. Do with what you have been given. Return to God. I think my epitaph could be if, if I'm at all fortunate. Well done, good and faithful servant. And I try to hold that in front of me to guide me as an overarching value. There's a bit of an overarching value in the prayer that this congregation is praying, especially today, as we're looking towards our next rector. And you will be saying, help us to listen anew to you and to each other so that we may discern the direction you would have us go. That's begin with the end in mind. That's proactive. That's seek first to understand and to be understood. And my hope would be, and I'll tell you the truth to some degree, my expectation having lived with you now for a couple of months, that perhaps taking a look at the words at the end of today's gospel, but applying it to this parish as you go through this faithful work, as you listen carefully to God being proactive, seeking first to understand and to be understood, going through each and every one of these pieces as you begin now with the end in mind. With said of Jesus, the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. My prayer as you go through this process with this diligence is this, that the congregation not only became strong, but was stronger and truly exhibited as it was filled with wisdom and the favor of God was upon them. All these words I offer in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.